All right, guys, hope everyone had a, had a good weekend. Got a lot to discuss today. So disclaimer, as usual, you know, everything we discuss is for informational purposes only. Do your own research. You're all big boys, right? So key economic events for the week ahead. We have um, tomorrow job openings, Tuesday NFIB small business in the index, and also producer price index. Wednesday, we have CPI and core CPI, as well as federal budget. Thursday, we have initial jobless claims, both regular and federal and state. Um, we also have continuing jobless claims, both regular, federal and state, import price index, retail sales on Friday, retail sales excluding autos, productivity, unit labor costs, uh, industrial production, capacity, utiliza utilization, consumer sentiment index, and then business inventories. And I got a few questions this week about these indicators because I'm not sure if everyone understands what they actually mean. So we'll be discussing these a little bit more in depth so you can, so you can understand more why they're significant when they're reported and, what, and, and, and how, to, how to interpret them when the numbers come out, right? So understanding indicators, starting with the uh, consumer price index, right? What is the consumer price index, the CPI? It's a measure of the average change over time in the prices paid by consumers for a market basket of consumer goods and services, right? Um, essentially what it means is that it, it tracks um, various different goods, which I'll show in a sec, um, and, de and depicts how the pricing is changing over time. So we can see if we're paying more or less for different goods and services, like you know, food, energy, for example, right? Why is it important, right? Well, when prices rise, the purchasing power of money drops, right? In a given country. I'm sure you've heard of you know, Zimbabwe or Venezuela having hyperinflation and, you, and they have to use wheelbarrows to take cash to buy a loaf of bread, right? When prices drop, it means the purchasing power of money increases. The CPI is often used to estimate the extent to which this purchasing power of money changes in a given country, right? In this case, we'll be discussing the context of the US. And for these reasons, it, it is a very widely used and important measure of inflation or deflation, right? How does this affect the stock market? Well, when the CPI rises, indicating that inflation is, is occurring, it forces the US Fed to look at economic policy with regards to possibly raising interest rates, right? And the danger in keeping rates low as inflation rises is that it can permanently erode the purchasing power of Americans in that USD will decline in value as we've seen over the past few weeks. Last week, the USD lost three and a half percent in value, which is you know, a drastic decline for the world's leading currency, right? And um, this erosion of purchasing power due to inflation, it goes against one of the Fed's primary mandates, which is to keep inflation at around 1.9%. 1, 1 the second mandate obviously being to keep employment at optimal levels, right? Now, if the Fed raises rates, a stock market crash is all but assured, given that there are so many corporations right now and, and individuals that are saddled with debt, right? And I've been mentioning this for, for a while now, and we'll probably see it over the next couple of years where inflation will occur due to all the printing that's been, occurred, um, been occurring. And that will precipitate the Fed either making the hard decision of not raising rates and allowing hyperinflation to occur, which would be terrible for the average U.S. consumer, um, or raising rates to combat inflation and thereby keeping prices tame, but destroying the stock market and possibly the economy as well, right? So you can see over here the basket of goods that are covered um, under the CPI, right? So... You have, you, know, you have food, you have cereals, bakery products, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, dairy, fruits and vegetables, uh, beverages of, you know, for, for non-alcoholic. Uh, you have energy, you have utilities, commodities, you know, apparel, so on and so forth, right? And that's um, important to monitor because you wanna see how much you're paying over time for different goods. And if I have $10 today and it can buy me you know, a loaf of bread carton of eggs and, 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 and a carton of milk, but in six months, I can only buy a loaf of bread and either a carton of eggs or a carton of milk, I have a problem, right? Because I'm not making more money 
but I can uh, purchase less goods. That's an issue, right? So it's important to monitor that, that indicator. And we have that coming out on, um, on Wednesday. So Wednesday, look, look at that um, indicator at, at 8.30 in the morning. And I suggest even reading up on what is reported because it's important um, to develop for you guys, uh, for, for educational purposes, understand what's happening in the economy, right? Because the Fed will be forced to take some kind of action if they start seeing prices ramping up, right? Due to inflation. The second indicator we're gonna discuss is jobless claims, right? So what are jobless claims, right? They're a stat that's reported weekly by the US Department of Labor. You can find their information at um, www.bls.gov that counts the number of people filing to receive unemployment insurance benefits, right? And there are two categories, right? There's initial jobless claims, which are comprised of people filing for the first time and there are continuing jobless claims comprised of unemployed people who have already been receiving unemployment benefits, right? Now, why is this important? Well, jobless claims are important uh, because they're a leading indicator in the economy that is, is very indicative of the employment situation as well as the overall health of the economy, right? When a growing number of people willing to work are unable to, work, to find work, it's usually a poor sign for the economy. Now, right now, because of the stimulus plan uh, due to the coronavirus that the US is paying out, those, uh, those $600 checks they're paying out, right? Uh, a lot of people that can work, that have jobs available are not working because they're making more money by sitting at home, right? That's a big issue. And now Trump is proposing cutting the, cutting the um, stimulus from $600, uh, per, uh, I think it's per week, I believe, um, to $400, right? So cutting it a fair bit, and then dropping it in October down to 70% of one's wages, right? That's still a disincentive to work because a lot of people would rather sit at home, unfortunately, and collect a paycheck, even if it's $200 less, than go to work, right? And a lot of employers can't find people that are willing to work more menial jobs, which is an issue, right? So it's important to monitor these uh, statistics because you can see in them, if you delve deeper on the bls.gov website, you can see where employment is growing, where it is declining. And that is a, a indicator of the health of the economy overall, right? Um, part of the problem with the US economy is that it's largely consumer driven, which means that the services sector comprises a, a, dis, a disproportionate number of jobs in the economy, right? So that's why they've been hit, hit so hard because most people are working at restaurants, movie theaters, um, you know, bars, cafes, clubs, for example, right? You know, you, uh, you have valley drivers, um, so, so on and so forth, right? How does this affect the stock market? Well, the US Fed, again, has two primary mandates, as I just mentioned, right? To keep inflation near 1.9% and to maintain the highest level of employment possible. If jobless claims rise, it forces the Fed to take action to simulate new job creation, which has, has resulted in them cutting interest rates, right? That's why we're at 0% zero, zero right now. And this has been largely bullish for the market overall, but if you see a, a decline in, uh, in jobless claims, plus you see inflation picking up, that may force the Fed to act against what they've said in the past, right? Which is, you know, uh, Jerome Powell has said they will be, be very uh, accommodative, but if they see hyperinflation occurring, he will have to act to combat that, right? So again, very important, right? And you can see the statistic over here, the, the graph of uh, historical unemployment rate. You see how high it went back in March and April, right? And it's coincided with um, a recession almost every time. So this could be a, a shallow recession, but I think it'll be a more prolonged one given that the Fed has acted inappropriately in that they've, um, they've printed so much money that they've really devalued and debased the US dollar. And we're already seeing price inflation in precious metals like gold and silver, for example, and that will cascade across to uh, many different things, right? So for example, cell phones have gold and silver in them, right? The manufacturers are gonna have to pass the cost on consumers. Therefore, those device costs will go up over time, right? Or the corporation will have lower profit margins, which means that they can hire less people or spend less money on marketing, for example, like Apple, right? The third thing is retail sales, which is also very important uh, to monitor that, that that's on, on Friday morning as well. So keep an eye on that. Friday morning is going to be very important for the market. Um, the U.S. retail sales report measures the U.S. retail industry each month, 
and the U.S. Census Bureau surveys uh, almost 5,000 um, different corporations to collect retail sales data. It shows the total sales and the percentage change for that month, which would be for uh, July, the past month. It also reports on the percentage change in year-over-year -year sales for the last 12 months, right? The report will list two different numbers, retail sales and then retail sales ex auto, right? That means without autom automobile sales included, right? And the reason for that is that auto sales can skew the overall number because they're such a big ticket item, right? Um, why is this important again? Because um, re uh, retail sales numbers are, are, are a very uh, important indicator because consumer spending drives most of the economic activity, right? Thus, retail sales data depicts the health of the US economy. And if you think about all the people and companies involved in producing, distributing, selling goods, you use every single day, like you know, food, watches, clothes, cell phones, laptops, TVs, so on and so forth, that's a massive proportion of the population, right? And again, it goes back to jobs. So they're all working in symbiosis, right? Um, you, have, you, have, you have CPI, you know, uh, prices rise, means that people can't, can buy less, they consume less, retail, retail sales go down, jobless num numbers go up, right? They're all working uh, together symbiotically, right? How does this affect the stock market? Well, Wall Street generates its own estimates before the Census Bureau issues a report. And if the street uh, numbers are far higher or lower than the actual numbers reported, it can cause an increase in market volatility and turmoil, right? Generally speaking, if the numbers reported are far, are far um, lower than the actual numbers reported, so, I mean, sorry, if the, if, if there were, if the, if the, if the number, the actual number is, is, uh, is lower than the expected number, it causes a market sell off usually because it's a very bearish indicator, right? Um, so Friday is going to be an important day to monitor because this data comes out for July, right? And it would be the, the first month where most states were open for, you know, uh, malls and whatnot, right? So we're going to have a, a good glimpse into the uh, health of the economy from, uh, from last month on Friday. And overall, you can see over here the, um, the seasonality of the past few years, and you can see how far it, it declined back in April, right? It was down 14.7%. Then it popped back up 18.2% back when Trump was tweeting about it and, and boasting about how great the economy is, right? Meanwhile, you know, it's recovering from a, the worst retail sales data in history, right? So we're going to want to see a um, decent number, and I believe the, um, the estimate on that is... Where is it? Seven and a half, I'm oh, sorry. So, uh, actual is 2% for, for July and um, previous was seven and a half percent. So I think the estimate is gonna be around 5%. I gotta check, check on that though. Um, where were we? Um, the other indicator to measure is productivity as well, right? And that is measured by comparing the amount of goods and services produced with the inputs which wish, with which they were used in production, right? Labor producti productivity is a ratio of the output of goods and services to the labor hours devoted to the production of the output. So for example, if I have a worker making me widgets and he can make me you know, 100 widgets over the course of 100 hours, that's one widget per hour, right? Uh, whereas if I have a worker making me 200 widgets over, over 100, hour, 100 hours, he's making me double the amount of widgets. Therefore, productivity has increased. I'm able to sell more widgets um, high, have higher margins as well, higher volumes of sales, and possibly hire more workers, right? Um, why is productivity important? It increases uh, in output and, uh, sorry, increases in output can only be due to, to increases in, in the inputs to the pr production process or to the efficiency with which they are used, right? With growth and productivity, an, an economy gains the ability to produce and also consume, increasing more goods and services um, in the same amount of work. Right, so um, countries trade their goods and services across borders, which is why you have imports and exports. And if a country is, is very, very uh, productive, they can trade more of their goods for more of another country's goods, thereby allowing them to, to consume more, right? So it helps with, um, with numerous different measures in the economy, but how does it affect the stock market, right? Well, when product productivity is near its peak, um, it's usually a sign of a market top. And when it's anemic, usually signals a, that, there's, that there's room for growth and productivity, right? Because obviously if you're making, for example, 20 widgets, um, you know, on, 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 a, uh, on, a, on a shop floor versus your average of 100, 
you know, now you're making far less and you have room to increase that productivity, right? And that's happened a lot in the last few months because corporations have been closed due to coronavirus, right? So I'm sure you all heard about you know, Tesla's factory being closed in California and, and Musk going you know, crazy over it. Um, that's productivity, right? Loss. Um, so, so now we, we could see a further rise in the market because a lot of different indicators are lining up, but you want to see productivity um, increasing again because it's not at a peak right now, right? And you can see these uh, indicators from the past few years as well, productivity, right? So we were at 108.029 for um, January of 2020. Um, oops, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it oh yeah. And the final one is the uh, CSI, right? Consumer Sentiment, Sentiment Index. And what is this, right? It's a measurement um, and economic indicator of the overall health of the economy as determined by consumer opinion, right? So um, pretty much they survey households, uh, I believe it's 5,000 households they survey, and they ask them numerous questions on the survey that indicate the sentiment overall, right? That's how they get the, the CSI number, right? And, and it, um, it factors in uh, each person's feelings toward his or her current financial health, the health of the economy as a whole in the short term and the prospects for longer term economic growth, right? Why is it important? Investors follow this very closely, right? As it provides a useful indicator of how much demand there is for the goods and services produced by companies listed on the stock market, right? And how does this affect the stock market? Well, very bullish consumer sentiment can be bad for the economy because this is typically a leading indicator, right? So when people buy lots of goods and services, prices can rise very, very rapidly, right? And again, to stamp out, infl to stamp out inflation, the Fed can hike interest rates, right? Increasing the cost of borrowing tends to slow economic growth and weigh on exports. Higher interest rates strengthen the value of currencies, right? But thus far, we've seen lower rates and thus the, the, the debasement of the US dollar, right? Which means that it's losing its purchasing power. And because they don't create a lot of actual goods in the United States anymore, because they stopped manufacturing, it's mostly a data-driven economy. Now you have you know, Facebook, Google, Netflix, um, th those three are, are part of the, top, the big five. Uh, Microsoft, for example, they don't actually create any physical goods, right? It's all software. So they're not actually creating any more uh, additional capacity in the economy for productivity and growth, right? Um, very bearish consumer se sentiment can be a, uh, good for the economy because it, it has the opposite chain reaction of effects to those mentioned above, right? Um, you can see over here, the indicators over the past uh, couple of years on CSI. So that'll be on, on, I think it's Friday as well. Let me see. CSI is on, actually, sorry, no, Wednesday, right? I know that's CPI on Wednesday and you have CSI on Friday as well. So Friday you have 8.30 in the morning, retail data, productivity as well. And then you have a 10 a.m. Uh, CSI, right? So just for you guys to understand what these actually mean, because I'm sure you, you, know, you, you watch CNBC and you see these numbers come out, you're like, okay, great. Um, you know, CSI beat, beat, beat the um, expected number, right? What does that actually mean? And, and, how, and how will it affect my positions in the market, right? Well, you need to understand how each metric can possibly affect the, um, the Fed acting in the future, right? Because FOMC occurs once a month. So you might be, be thinking about these indicators in a, in, a, in a month's time when the next FOMC occurs, right? Or, or in a few weeks time anyway, right? Um, the VIX is nearing a pretty important gap fill from back when we uh, had that massive gap up in February on that huge decline in the market. <clears throat> We're not too far from there. We hit, I think, um, 20.6 on Friday. And uh, the gap fill will be at around 16. So if we do uh, keep melting up in the market on low volume, which is usually what happens, um, you're going to see the VIX go down lower and lower and lower. And that will provide for a great opportunity to get some insurance on your portfolio uh, because obviously puts will be cheap, right? Um, whether or not it'll actually occur in the next few weeks is anyone's guess. Earnings season's almost over. We have the election coming up in less than three months now, right? We have August, September, October, and then election time, assuming that it's still on for November, right? Which if you watch the, uh, the Axios um, uh, interview with Donald Trump, he kind of skirted that discussion uh, when he was asked about the election occurring and if, if he was gonna you know, push it back or not, right? I don't think he has the power to do so, but um, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised with anything that occurs right now. 
Uh, next thing is um, SPY is right now trading at an area where it's only traded above current levels for seven trading days back in February, right? So we're not far from all time highs. We have a number of gaps in the chart right now, um, namely around 285 and then also at 254 area, I believe. And then also there's a gap way low, um, the downside over at around uh, 230 area as well. So three big, big gaps that should fill out in the next, you know, could be the next six months, could be the next two years, right? Who knows? But they will fill eventually, right? Uh, and the catalyst is anyone's guess, but uh, right now you should trade cautiously. When you're seeing volume uh, dry up as we're rising, keep in mind it's also a um, function of August being a large vacation time for most market participants that have a lot of clout. You know, most of the fund managers are off in the Hamptons, you know, uh, eating caviar and sipping champagne, right? So keep that in mind. Um, earnings this week. This is um, still a busy week. Not a lot of heavy hitters. Uh, tomorrow we have Mercado Libre. They actually uh, delayed earnings from last week, which is interesting. Barrett Gold in the morning as well. Uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Uh, Marriott. And then after hours, you have Novavax, the, one, one of the makers of the, of the coronavirus vaccine. That's uh, up about, I think, 5,000% this year so far. One of the top performers. And then um, Tilray, Simon Property Groups, um, which is the largest uh, mall owner in America. They're actually in talks right now with uh, Amazon, apparently, to convert JCPenney's and Sears locations into Amazon fulfillment centers, which is pretty interesting. And I'm actually gonna be discussing that at the very end of the session as the, um, the trade idea of the week. And then I'll be, there's a uh, 10 cent as well. Um, Tuesday, there is Neo in the morning, the uh, Chinese EV maker. Um, that should have a huge move in other, other direction. Uh, you have Cisco, which is it, the, um, the, um, the, the food service supplier. They supply, you know, like cutlery and different and foods and went on to uh, restaurants that might have gotten hit pretty hard. Um, Canada Goose, I'm not really sure how they did, but um, I know the stock has been beat up over the last year or so. Uh, then after hours, you have uh, Red, Red Robin Gourmet Burgers, and that's pretty much it for Tuesday. <coughs> um, Wednesday, you have Cisco After Hours, Smile Direct, Lyft, and Wheaton Precious Metals. Um, so Wheaton Precious Metals should have a pretty good quarter given that they are largely involved in silver and gold, right? Keep an eye on them as well. And then Thursday, we have uh, Baidu After Hours. That's the Chinese version of, of Google. Um, so keep an eye on them. Um, otherwise, Friday, we have DraftKings in the morning as well. That should have a nice move too. Um, that's all I'm looking at this week, really. I know people have been playing purple as well. I'm not sure what they do, but uh, they report on Thursday after close. So if you are trading that, keep an eye on that too. <coughs> um, yeah, that's, that's it for earnings. So SPY analysis for the week. Again, I mentioned earlier, we have the upper possible move to, um, to 341.68, which would mark a new all-time high in the market. The current all-time high is 339.08. So the, uh, the potential move is about 2% for the week. Uh, we've been grinding higher and higher and higher. And um, you know, it's possible we have a further run up before a nice big pullback into the election. So just trade cautiously, don't short uh, unnecessarily, you know, like don't be, don't be buying puts for the purpose of buying puts. If you have a portfolio, you need a hedge. In that regard, you can hedge obviously. And, and as we rise higher, Puts will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, right? The lower move is 327.38, which won't even um, you know, fill that gap on the weekly chart from last week, right? <clears throat> uh, for a triple Q, NASDAQ 100 ETF, we have the upper PM at 280.07 and the lower move at 262.77. So as you've all seen, you know, Apple and Facebook have been grinding higher like crazy. Uh, Amazon as well. Google has been doing all right post earnings, even though their earning report was terrible. Um, typically you see, um, you see a blow off top in the market before a nice big crash. And right now I think that's what we're seeing uh, with regards to the, the uh, mega caps like Facebook and Apple just popping uh, nonstop. Um, trade cautiously, right? If you own Apple at this level, you might want to consider, you know, hedging yourself a little bit. Um, you know, you can do a, a caller, sell a call option out of the money 
use the proceeds from that call option to buy a put option that will hedge you for free essentially. Right. Um, that's not a bad idea to, to, uh, to use if you're going about a month out, because if the market declines, chances are it'll, it'll be led by Apple and Facebook, for example. Right. Um, yeah. So the uh, PM for the week is 3.2% pretty large move expected or potential move. Right. And then the Russell is pushing uh, that gap fill on uh, from February as well, right over at like 165 area. So we're not too far from that gap fill. Um, the PM for the week is 3.8%. Upper move is 162 roughly, and lower move is 150. <clears throat> and then from last week, we had uh, a number of breaches, right? We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten that breached and close inside the uh, potential range of values, right, uh, for the PMs. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that actually closed outside that range. And if you notice, they're mostly tech, right? So you had AMD that popped up outside the range. You had, uh, you had Boeing, they're, they're not tech obviously, but uh, Disney, Facebook, um, Rus the Russell Small Cap Index. You had uh, Nikola Motors and you had uh, SQ, right? Square. So interesting week to see all these other ones, you know, break you had, you had zoom breach the, uh, the PM and then close inside of it. You had uh, Wayfair do the same thing. You also had spy, um, uh, Virgin galactic Shopify, uh, triple Q NASDAQ ETF, NVIDIA, um, Microsoft and GLD as well as Apple. Right? So that, could have been the top potentially on Friday on uh, on Apple. Again, they got a nice big upgrade from uh, Wedbush Securities. I think price target is now 515 by them. But typically you see these upgrades occur after a market rally has already occurred because analysts are very behind the curve, right? So they usually upgrade after a rally incur occurs and they downgrade after a decline occurs. So don't ever use analyst upgrades or, or declines uh, or, or downgrade story as a indicator for when to get in and when to get out because they're usually behind the curve, right? Um, ticker analysis for, for the week ahead. So again, we, we have a lot of tickers over here to analyze. Um, I'll be posting the, the um, presentation on the server if, it, if it'll fit. If not, I'll be emailing everyone a copy of this and I'll be posting each of these slides, uh, at least uh, this one and these three slides over here in the, uh, in the, in the uh, strategy session area, right? So um, the trade for the week that I was discussing was uh, SPG. Right, Simon Property Group, right? So they have pretty heavy support at around 60 bucks. You can see that they've been consolidating in that area. Um, and they've been trading in a pretty narrow range between about 65 and 60 for the past roughly month or uh, month and a half. They were at 95 not too long ago, but they had a sharp uh, increase up there. And they have pretty heavy support at, at um, around 50 ish. <clears throat> they also have gap fills at 101.50 and 119.51 as well. Uh, also a tiny one, I shouldn't have already been filled, sorry. So uh, analyzing the uh, IV SKU, you can see that, that the IV is highest for August expiration at 75.2%. Now it's highest obviously because they report earnings on Monday, right? Monday after close. So after earnings occur, um, the move will occur as well. And then IV will decline, right? Uh, once it settles, um, the trade that I'm talking about will probably not be available anymore because um, I'm, I'm going to be discussing, uh, discussing the uh, September expiration. And the idea here is to uh, use a call debit spread in conjunction with a cash secured put to generate a nice 10 wide spread on SPG. Your debit amount will be around 20 cents and your, your upside would be $9.80 uh, upside with, 20, with a risk of 20 cents, right? Uh, keep in mind, what you'd be doing is you'd be selling a cash secured put at the 50 strike for September uh, 18th expiration, so, so about 40 days out, right? That means you need to have margin available for the next 40 days to take possession of SPG stock if it were to decline below $50 per share. So essentially you would own it at $50 and um, 20 cents in a worst case scenario, right? If it, if it were to pop up to 70, uh, 70, 20, you're breaking even there. And if it were to go to 80 uh, or above, you'd make max profit of $9.80 um, with 20 cents of risk, right? So it's, it's a pretty nice asymmetry of risk play if you don't mind owning it at 50 bucks a share 
um, which I don't at all whatsoever. My, my, my cost basis is actually below that right now, which is nice. But um, I think it'll probably have a nice green day tomorrow prior to earnings, given that the uh, the news of them having Amazon fulfillment centers fill up those JC Penney and Sears locations, which were the biggest concerns for their their properties because they take up so much uh, square square footage, right? So that was the idea for the week that I wanted to share with you guys. And you can you can you can take it with it if you want to do you know a narrower spread, you can go with uh, a narrower spread. If you want to go with a wider one, you can go with a wider one. If you want to go with different expiration dates, you can as well. But keep in mind that you're getting higher higher IV for September expiration as it, as indicated by the orange line over here, right? January is very low as as is uh, October, right? So that's the idea for the week. Um, any questions, guys? What was that um, hedge idea you said when you were talking when we were when you had the Q Q Q pulled up? Uh, you mean the hedge on Apple? Yeah, you said Apple or Facebook. Maybe I can't remember. I just missed it. Yeah, it was on Apple. So it's it's called a caller, right? So, um, for example, one second. Let me pull up my uh, my chart. One sec. So. Apple chart. Sorry, someone's calling right now. They always call you when you're doing I'm, something. See so ya. Yeah, yeah. You, you know my pain, Paul. You know my pains. Um, <laughs> it's freaking out on chat one day. <laughs> yeah, I know. So um, let's say you want to hedge yourself. Um, how far out do you want to go? Do you want to hedge, you know, two weeks out, a month out, right? If you go a month out, you're going to be able to hedge yourself pretty well, right? So um, current price of Apple is 445 a share. You can go ahead and you can sell, for example, let's see, maybe the 500 strike calls, which is you know pretty far out of the money, right? So I can sell these for about uh, 580 uh, credit. And then if you want to, you could use that money to buy a a $400 put, for example, right? So you, you, you'd have a small debit here of about 50 cents, and then you'd pretty much be hedging yourself at 400 for a, a September expiration. Keeping in mind- It's only if you own 100 shares, I assume. Uh, pardon? It's only if you own 100 shares, I assume. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, if you, if you own 100 shares. If you don't own 100, 100 shares, you can use um, spreads in the same way if you want. Um, what you do is you just, you just simply create a debit call spread over here, like you know, 505, sorry, 500 to 510, for example. You pull in a credit of like whatever, a dollar, I don't know, a dollar 15, something like that. And then you could purchase yourself a, a put spread. But it, it, won't have the, it, it won't have the same effect because you, you don't have open ended um, upside on the put side, right? So, it wouldn't really have that, that great effect. Uh, if you don't have 100 shares, you'd have to, I guess, hedge just conventionally and, and buy puts uh, straight away, right? Uh, which in this case, you pay like you know, 600 bucks for, for 100 shares. You don't actually need 100 shares of, of hedging there. So you could, you could delta hedge yourself. You could, you could buy the, uh, the 400s and buy the 400s, for example, and sell the, let's see, let, let, uh, let's say you own, how many shares do you own right now? Uh, 30 something. 30, so you need to delta hedge 30, let's say 30 shares, right? So um, if you want to delta hedge 30 shares, you got to, you buy this, the 0.4 delta contract, and you'd want to sell the 0.1 delta contract over here. So you'd be paying a pretty pretty premium overall to hedge yourself uh, about $13.50. It's not really worth it overall because now you're taking off that from your from your current gains on your position, right? So, um, or or you can go for a short term expiration date, right? If you think it's going to decline uh, over over the short term, you can do that instead, right? It's harder yeah. it, it, it's harder as as, as an uh, individual to hedge yourself with um, with a, a sub hundred share position, right? I was about to say I understand what you're doing now because if it hits five hundred, I mean, it's much better when you have the hundred shares to sell the five hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because essentially, what you'd be saying is, I'm okay getting rid of it at 500 bucks, and if it declines down to 400, I'm okay also um, getting rid of it at, at 400 bucks as well over here, right? Because you're selling the call, which which is a covered call, 
and then you're buying the put option, right? Which gives you the right to, to sell your shares at hundred at four hundred dollars strike price prior to expiration, right? So pretty much you're stuck in the range of between four hundred and five hundred for the next month, and you're saying, you know what? If it goes to you know to to four ninety, all that's going to happen is, is, is I'm making an, uh, an additional forty five bucks per share, which is great because I, I, I only uh, incur a debit on my position of let's say again you sell this for uh, for five eighty and you buy the four hundred strike put. Um, your debit is like what is like 50 cents, right? So in that case, you're spending 50 bucks to head yourself uh, for, for a whole month into the, the election after we've had a massive run up. And the reason why I'm saying this is because Apple has two huge gaps in the chart right now, like two massive gaps, like uh, over here, right here, and also over here, right? Two big gaps. And if you notice on the chart, typically these gaps fill, there's also a gap right, right over here too. Um, Come on. There's a gap right over here. And there's also a gap, uh, that one wasn't filled either. So there's like, there's like four different gaps in the chart right now. There's one right there as well. And I guess this one, no, that one qualifies a gap right there either. So there's, there's, there's actually five massive gaps in the chart, right? right there as well. So you can see that, that, that there's a lot of gaps here. So Structurally, there's not a lot of structure on Apple's chart right now, right? It's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty weak. If you start selling off hard, you're going to see Apple come down pretty fast, right? As you saw over here when we, you know, we were up pretty high and then you saw a fast decline of 20% really quickly, right? Um, that's what you'd expect to happen, right? And from the current price, I mean, it, it might not happen before end of August because the uh, four to one stock split is occurring end of August, but if it does occur before then, then you're kind of uh, SOL, right? Does that help, Paul? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, Jay also pointed out March 24th gap as well. Yeah, I think that's over here. Yeah, right over here. Good call, Jay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if no, Matt's- hey, Nick, um, quick thing on NASDAQ chart. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many of us here are following Elliott Waves here or not, but looking at it, um, we can expect a pullback. Um, it's on its last uh, fifth leg. Mm -hmm. So it's made the uh, first leg up um, doing the correction now. So that big red candle that's on the daily on NASDAQ um, can pull back all the way to uh, 10,800 range um, if that does play out and then push up from there all the way and then finish up on 13,000 on the finish of fifth leg before doing a main big correction. So, so, you're, so you're saying it would likely pull back to around like, like 255 ish perhaps, and then push to like two, 290 or so. Yeah. Um, well, that's on spy. So on NASDAQ, um, I got to, yeah, yeah. it, it generally does follow the same pattern, but on NASDAQ, yeah, it's, we can expect um, um, like a, almost a uh, 10,800 to 10,700 range of uh, pullback. Yeah, so, so not, not a massive pullback, but then, but then possibly a, a massive move. I would send a screenshot, but I can't share it on the thing. Oh, here, I'll, I'll give you permission to share if you want here, one sec. Might make it easy for you to see. Yeah, sure, one sec, permission. Um, this seems to be a consensus with whoever, a lot of people that do Violet Wave. Yeah, let me post this. I just gave you permission. All right, let me load it real quick. Sure. All right, so that's the current outlook. Okay, I see, yeah. So that'd be, that'd be waves one, two, three, four, and five, I guess, right? Yep. And, and you so just, like just finished the third leg, had a ABC correction on fourth. Uh, now we're onto the main fifth leg. And then the, as they call it, the minute marks in there, they'll have another five leg move inside that. So it seems like it's done the first leg. Now it's doing the correction for that first leg inside that fifth leg. And then it'll mm -hmm. go up from there. Interesting. Yeah. No, something to keep but It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, if it does play out like this. Yeah, and of course, it's, yeah. nothing's hundred percent, but gives a good probability. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, they asked if uh, the gaps in Triple Q match up with the ones in Apple, and I think I think they actually do. Yes, because there there are I think five gaps in Triple Q as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, any more questions, guys? I was going to ask. Uh, now you were talking about if uh, the inflation goes up, and then I mean, obviously, we've seen like in 2018 and, and uh, last summer when they tried to raise the interest rates and the stock market freaked out. What? Yep. How would? Is that what we're seeing a lot of the companies with, that have plenty of money pull away? Like, because since they don't have any debt, I mean, how would it affect like Apple? They don't have any debt. You know? I mean, did they get pulled down with everyone else? I guess. Well, no. Uh, Apple actually ha has a lot of debt. They have a lot of cash as well. well that's what I just say. They're they're they have debt, but they don't. I guess they still have to pay more interest on the debt, regardless. Well, it's a very low interest rate because because they they have um, high grade bonds, right? Because. Yeah. Cause Financial position, they're not really uh, worried to creditors at all. Yeah, because they have enough money to pay it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep, so. so it wouldn't affect them as much as it would other companies. No, that no that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would affect the, you know, companies like Tesla, for example, which has you know, a ton of debt and not a lot of cash on hand, or it would affect someone like, like uh, SPG has a lot of debt as well, right? It depends on what the debt is rated at and what the interest rates are on those debts as well, right? Because even a half percentage point increase on a massive amount of debt can cause a corporation that is cash flow, you know, break even or perhaps cash flow positive to go cash flow negative, which requires them to then raise funds elsewhere because what is cash flow, right? It, well, if you're, if you're cash flowing positive, that means you're, you're pulling in enough revenue to cover all your expenses, right? A lot of the problem right now is a lot of corporations are not cash flow positive. Like for example, Shopify, right? Shopify is a great example of a super overvalued tech stock that people are optimistic on with no real rationale behind it, right? So they're currently worth, I believe, 125 billion off the, off the top of my head. I think they have 2 billion in, in revenues and they're losing, I think it's $50 million right now, right? But their free cash flow is still negative which means that they don't have enough money to finance their operations. And a lot of their operations are, are being financed through debt, right? Um, that's not good. And a lot of tech corporations are in the same boat, wherein they're just raising more and more capital. I mean, uh, Virgin Galactic, for example, did it last week where they issued more stock. But we've seen Nikola do that. We've seen, um, who else? There have been numerous corporations that have done that in the past little while. Tesla raised more, um, more cash from... Uh, share, share, uh, share issuance back when it was around 900 bucks. Um, so it's happening more and more where corporations that are not cash flow positive are, um, are just raising money elsewhere. And the reason why they can do that is because money is free right now. Like, there's, there's no interest rates. It's 0%, right? So to get, get VC funding, you know, you show them a business plan and, you know, if it sounds half decent and you have a, a decent connection with them, boom, you have, you know, 4 million bucks in your account or whatever for a small business, right? Or 5 million bucks. Um, I know, I know a few guys that have gotten funding in Silicon Valley in the last two months or so, and they're not cash flow positive at all. They have no profits to speak of, and they're, they're, they're pulling in a lot of cash, right? Obviously, uh, for equity stakes in the company, right? But it just goes to show how unhealthy the economy is where you have all these, all these corporations running on no actual financial fundamentals, right? It's all just, you know, smoke and mirrors and optimism, kind of like weed stocks were, you know, a little while back. And then you had, you know, I guess the Bitcoin pop, which is different because obviously Bitcoin is not a corp corporation, right? But um, you're seeing a lot of froth in, in different markets. And that's indicative of, for one, people being bored, staying at home, tr trying to uh, make their money stretch out further than, than it actually is. And secondly, um, the, the prevalence of Robinhood, right? Which is making, uh, allowing people to trade for free, even though it's not free because they're paying a, a massive amount in the bid and ask spread that they're not actually getting because they're not filling um, appropriate orders, right? So they're, they're getting terrible fills, which means that they're actually giving up a lot of money on the bid and the ask whenever they're buying or selling on Robinhood, right? So they are the product um, that's, that is being sold to, um, to market makers, right? Um, any more questions, guys? Okay. Yep, Omar just said zombie companies. That's correct, man. Well, guys, I'm going to go and watch the um, hockey game. My team is down, I think, right now. 
one zip. So uh, I'm going to cut it short, but uh, have a great evening. Hope you, you guys enjoyed this. And if you have any questions at all, fire them away on Discord. Um, I'll be in voice chat tomorrow at uh, 9.30 a.m. as well. So let's have a good week, guys. Have a great evening and talk soon. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. No problem, guys. Okay. <laughs>